Amen. Pray with me. Father, we are thankful that a wonderful chain has come over us. Father, I can remember, and I'm sure many of us in this room can remember, when we were by nature children of wrath, following the course of this world, captive to the prince of the air, and we were by nature children of disobedience. But God, God being rich in mercy, God loving us before the foundations of the world, God calling us through the hearing and preaching of the gospel to make us new. We're thankful for a new birth. We're thankful for a new hope. We're thankful for a new life. And it is ours through Jesus. And so would you continue to change us from one degree to the next? Would you mature us in the faith by your word as it is read and heard and preached? May you show up and do your work with your people today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians. We'll be finishing up chapter 3. So I'll start with 1 Thessalonians 3, 11, and we'll read down through chapter 4, verse 8. We are making our way through the book. So we are in chapter 4, and we have one more good chapter left. So we're making our way through it. And a few things. Uh, I know this passage is written, and it has a, a masculine bent to it. Uh, but in Paul's day, whenever he used the, the Greek word for brothers, it was inclusive. It meant brothers and sisters. And so I want to, just in case it looks like I'm leaning hard on the men, I, I, I want the ladies to also kind of know that this is not just an issue that men wrestle with. This is a brokenness issue. Uh, and it's not just something adults wrestle with. Studies are showing that even our teenagers and even our preteens. And so I may, it may sound like I'm talking to men, but I'm talking to everyone in this room. Let's read the word of God. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification or your growth in holiness, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Amen. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased our first home. Many of you know we stayed in the manse that was right next door to Redeemer that is now, it's been leveled, it's a parking lot. But when we were there, we got addicted to HGTV. And so we knew that once we finished seminary that we would eventually have to buy a house. We knew that we wanted to stay in Jackson. We knew that we wanted to stay near the church. We knew that we wanted to have a place where we could practice hospitality. And we knew that we wanted to get in there and do it ourselves. And so we bought a foreclosure. And then the six months of work started tearing out walls, tearing up floors, tearing out, tearing down uh, wallpaper, installing recessed lights. Some of you in this congregation, you spent hours upon hours with me. I was in that house every single day for six months. And then finally we could move in. After six months of just chaos, we moved in. And it was, I mean, you know that feeling when you kind of get to a place and it's yours and all of your hard work is now paying off. You kind of get in your house and it's just this, <sighs> it's kind of one of those moments. Well, it was December when we moved in. And about a month later, our air conditioning unit went out. Our heating unit went out. And because it was a foreclosure, we bought it as is. Which meant that whatever happened to that house, it was our responsibility. And so I quickly called someone and says, hey man, it is freezing. Can you come and at least fix this? We called the guy, HVAC guy, he came to the house. He got a flashlight and he looked in there. He says, brother, I think you need to replace this unit. And I'm thinking, what do you mean? That's like $4,000. And 
And uh, he says, look, let me show you. And he showed me it was it was improperly vented. He showed me relay switches and bypasses that it, I mean, just stuffed inside of it that that the previous owner had just circumvented. I mean, he just went uh, rather than replace the unit. He just decided to just hodgepodge it. And then, I mean, on top of that, it was old. I mean, really old. And so I still wasn't a fan. I'm just like, brother, can we replace the relay? Whatever we can do to get it working. And then he says, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm worried about carbon monoxide poisoning. I'm worried that you will kill your entire family. And so my thinking, I, I didn't know what carbon monoxide was at the time. And so I'm thinking, man, won't I just smell it? Like, won't I just, I, I'll know, I'll, I'll smell it. And he's like, no, nah, brother, this right here, it's a silent killer. It, by the time it does its damage, it's too late. And so me, doing what I normally do, I said, okay, well, I called somebody else. I got him to do a, put a relay switch on it. And I went to Walmart and I bought two carbon monoxide detectors. <laughs> and I put one downstairs next to the unit and I put one upstairs uh, next to my kid's room. And I said, look, we're just going to roll with it. And uh, this went on for about two weeks. And finally, my wife was just like, what are you doing? Rip? And so I ended up like, you know, going and, and calling him back out there and we ended up getting a new unit. But I, I learned something in that. One, is it, sometimes it's the silent things that can do the most damage. Sometimes things that give us life and promote life, like a heater, can actually destroy life and take it. That sometimes in life we need something new to be done and not just a fixing of what's old. I say that because the sin that Paul is talking about in this text it typically does its damage in silence. It typically does its damage in silence. And by the time you, the, the problem surfaces, there's a lot of damage already done. And in case you haven't figured it out by the title, we're talking about sexual sin. That it is not like a lot of sins that Christians can get entangled in. You see, if you gamble, then I can look at your bank account statement and see right then that you have a gambling problem. If you're an alcoholic, someone can look at the amount of alcohol you are buying and consuming and they can watch the way the way that alcohol affects you. You can notice it that if you struggle with pride, it, it's typically all over people when they keep using this pronoun of I, I did this, I did that, I want that. Sexual immorality doesn't normally work that way. It works in private. The privacy of your phone, the privacy of your internet history, the privacy of relationships and fantasies that play itself out in your mind that no one would notice if they watched you. It goes undetected. And yet, when it does surface, damage has already been done. And what, what Paul does in this passage, it's a heavy passage. And I want to let you know up front that this is just heavy. But this passage is heavy. And there is good news. There really is good news at the end of this. But I think we have to press into what Paul wants to teach us about sexual immorality. And he's talking to people. He's talking to Christians in Thessalonica. And so what I want to do is show you this demand for holiness that was a reason why I had Ryan read that passage from Leviticus, because because there really is a demand in the Bible that God's people live holy lives. As a matter of fact, you see it in this passage. You see it over and over and over. Like, look at what Paul says in, in chapter three, verse 13, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness right there. So you see it once go down to chapter four. Go down to verse three, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And if you look at the bottom, it says your holiness. In other words, that's the second time Paul brings it up. You go to verse verse four. It says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor. That's that's three times he uses it. And then if you go down to the uh, chapter four, verse seven, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And so four times in this passage, Paul uses this word holiness. And the issue he's addressing in the context of holiness, it's sexual sin. In other words, he's saying God demands sexual holiness upon God's people. 
In other words, your theology and your walking with Jesus, that place deep inside of your hearts where there are sexual longings and desires that, that, that spill over into actions, Jesus says, I want lordship right there as well. So this whole passage, it's about the demand of holiness. This is not this is not a suggestion. This is not an encouragement. This is a demand. God Almighty, who has saved your soul, who has bought you and your body with the price. He now tells you to honor him with your body. This is not a suggestion. That's why Paul says in this text, whoever disregards this disregards not me, but you disregard God. He says this is what's pleasing to God in a day and age where it's all about pleasing me. Paul says, stop, Christian. What about pleasing the one who saved you? What does that factor into your sexuality? So this passage is about this demand of holiness. It's also about the danger of unholiness and it's also about deliverance. So this demand, this danger and then this deliverance, this hope that I think we can find that's in this passage. And so when I say this demand that God is demanding holiness, one, you see it in the passage. He says it four times. And so typically when we think about holiness, we think about ladies in long dresses. We think about not doing this and not doing this. All right. Let's let's set that aside for a second, because in, in, in God's mindset, when he thinks about holiness, there are two things. One, there's this this. He has redeemed you. And that's why when you read Leviticus chapter 20, I'm going to read it for you just so you, you can track it with me. You are to be holy to me, for I am the Lord, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I've set you apart from all of the peoples to be mine. And so right there, that's that's one of the first times this idea of holiness kind of comes out in the Bible. And God is basically saying this, that I'm the one who delivered you out of Egypt. I'm the one who worked and flexed my mighty hand and my outstretched arms. I'm the one who has purchased you. Now, as you march out of Egypt, I need to get Egypt out of your heart. You leave that stuff back there. You are set apart. You are holy unto me, the Lord. And you do not take your cue for living from the nations around you, but from me. And what right does he have to tell us how to live our lives? He's creator and he's redeemer. He's infinitely wise. And we are not. We are creatures. And so this whole idea of being holy, it comes from a posture of submission. It comes from this place of you're worthy. I'm not You're king. I'm not. You delivered me and you purchased me with your own blood. And so when God says who when we when we step back and say, well, how can he tell us that? He says, this is why I can tell you I'm holy. And I delivered you. I set you apart to be holy, to be my own. Now, what I love about this text is God doesn't just demand holiness in this area that he's a good father. He also spills it. Out. He spells it out for us. In other words, he said, I demand that you be holy with your sexuality. Well, then what does it look like, God? Tell us what it looks like when you say you, you are calling us to be holy. What does it look like? Go down with me down to uh, verse three of chapter four. For this is the will of God, your holiness or your sanctification or your growing in this area. And notice what he says, that it's, two, it's twofold, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's one. Then there's a, co a semicolon there. And then there, that, that's part B, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor. Right there. So that's the A and the B. So the A side of it says what? That we abstain, that we flee from, that we run from sexual immorality. Now, that word right there that he uses for sexual immorality is this Greek word pornea, which sounds a very familiar. It's where we get our word pornography from. So when Paul uses that, that there be no sexual immorality, that you abstain from it, that that word right there, pornea, in his day, it was the bucket word. Right. And so in the Bible, the Bible talks about bestiality. The Bible talks about um, Adultery, when a man sleeps with an, another woman or a woman sleeps with a man who's not her husband, it's adultery. He talks about fornication when there are two non-believers who aren't married, who are engaging in sexual activity. It also talks about homosexuality when there's a sexual attraction or an enactment with someone of the same sex that that the Bible gets very, very specific. If you don't believe me, go read Leviticus and, and look at how the, I mean, I mean, the Bible, the God is just like splitting hairs. It's not just sexual sin, but it's all ways of perversion. 
In other words, in this text, what Paul says is this word right there for sexual immorality, it's the catch all word. It's, it, it's intentionally vague and it encompasses everything. Any type of sexual perversion that you can think of, this word right here that Paul uses, he dumped, that's the catch all phrase. In other words, what he's saying is let there not be any type of sexual immorality be named among God's people. Any type. And then when you add what he says in the, the next chapter, he's, I mean, the next verse, he says that you not behave in the passion of lust. So even there, he starts to unpack that it's not just the, the illicit sexual activity. Lust is a desire that's misplaced. It's wanting something that you shouldn't have. And regardless if you act on it or not, adultery is already being committed in your heart. And that's exactly what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman with lustful intent, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And when you lay that on top of what Paul is saying, this is what Paul is saying. This is what he's putting before God's people. That holiness in the area of Christian sexuality, it means that none of that. The actions or the desires needs to be named amongst God's people. Which means it's sinful to fantasize about a man. It's sinful to fantasize about a woman. It's sinful to send text messages of your body to someone who is not your spouse. It's sinful to dress in a certain way that you show things to other people that should only be seen by your husband. It's sinful when a man can or a woman. And this is not just a masculine problem when you can sit and divulge hours of pornography week in and week out. It's sinful. It's sinful and it's wrong and it should not be named amongst God's people. That's what Paul is saying. That's the standard. And what he says is flee from it, run from it. Do a Joseph on it. When this thing is about to happen, you leave and you leave your coat right there. I mean, he still went to prison, but he was running from something, right? <laughs> he was running in Genesis, right? He still got punished, but the dude was running from it. Now, that's the A side of it. Now, the B side of it, well, well, all right, this tells me I need to run from the stuff that's out there, that that stuff out there does not need to be named amongst me. But, but there's also a, a B side to it, and, and this is one of the most debated verses in this whole book, because people don't really know what to do with that word body. So if you look at it, most of you right there which says that, that you abstain from sexual morality and that you, uh, let me, I want to make sure to read it correctly. That each one of you learn how to control his own body in holiness and in honor right there that each one of you learn how to or know how to control his own body right there. in most of your Bibles where you see body, there's going to be a number above it. And in my Bible, it's a number seven. And at the, if you go to the bottom of your Bible, it'll say that you find a wife. And, and people don't know, like, what did Paul mean? Did he did he mean that you learn how to find a wife in holiness and honor. And so the A side is avoid this. And then the B side would be, well, learn to find a wife. That could be the case because in first Peter chapter three, listen to what Peter says. The, the, the debate comes around how that word body, he does not use a normal body. He uses this word vessel. And so when Peter goes on to say in first Peter three, he says, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That's the same word that Paul uses in First Thessalonians. That's why at the bottom of that passage, at the bottom of your Bibles, commentators don't know. Like, did he mean vessel like Peter uses vessel? Did he mean vessel like the Old Testament used vessel? When it says, husbands, flee the adulterous woman. And it says, rather, drink water out of your what? Your own vessel, your own cistern. It says, flee her, delight in the breast of your own wife. And so in the Old Testament, there is this push, this emphasis, flee this, cleave here. But is that what Paul means in this text? Because there's another way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, well, he could be using vessel as in your own body. Rather not find your own wife, but learn how to control your own self. In other words, bring your own desires under submission. Now, which one is it? I don't know. I, I was over there with the camp where I think he was saying find a wife. In other words, abstain from this and learn to find a wife and love your wife. I used to be there. Like, really, I, a matter of fact, I, I, I talked about this passage three years ago at Jackson State. 
And the, I went back and looked at him like, man, like I, I felt that then. But now as I've been married longer and as I've watched people struggle, since when has being married cured you of your sexual sin? See, that's a lot of pressure to put on a man or a woman. If Paul is saying this, abstain from this, run from this and then run to a woman. Right. Or, or run to a spouse. Wait a minute. That means that that my spouse, that the Bible is telling me that she's the cure all, that she's the one that's going to fix me and bring me healing. Married men still lust. Married men still look at pornography. Being married does not take care of this inside. And so what I think Paul is saying is this thing fits together like hand and glove. Avoid, run from, abstain, don't do this, avoid it at all costs. That's outside. But then internally, you got to learn how to control this. In other words, if all you do is run and never take care of what's going on in your heart, you'll never get far in holiness in this area. And if all you do is look into your heart and you never have this posture to run and to do away with, you'll never make much way in this area. That it goes together like hand and glove. If a man or woman or child wants to be holy in the sight of the Lord, you run from anything. And you deal with what's going on in here. That those two things go together. This week when Steph Curry made all the, the three pointers, right? Y'all saw the meme. And in case you don't know what a meme is, right? A meme is like a picture from real life that someone puts a, 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 a statement on it about it. And so there's this picture, right? And, and, and there's an interview, like there's a real interview where, you seen it, Tasha? There's a real interview where Steph Curry is just like broke the record, broke the three point record. And there's like this really attractive lady. And she's the one doing the interview. And in the background, you see Steph Curry's mom. She got the black woman look on, on her face like, <laughs> you better watch it. And she kind of, you know, kind of ducked off a little bit. And then his wife, Aisha, I mean, she kind of sees it and she comes in and puts her hands on like both of them and, and just like gets right between them. But that's not the that's not the, the meme that, I'm, that that really got my attention. It was the one. And she's like this close to him. She's a beautiful lady. And he does his whole interview like this. <laughs> I mean, his head is like looking down. And, and, and the bottom, the, the, the quote that they put on there was, you know, sometimes it's real. This is how you guard your heart. In other words, what they're saying is he so loves his wife that even when he's in the front of this beautiful woman who's interviewing him, he's not looking at her. Look, I don't know if, if that's what was really going on. But I think that's the standard God is calling us to. That in the presence of something tempting in the presence of someone alluring, he is calling us stand down. And that's hard. He's calling us to run away. He's calling us to flee. Now, here's the question. How do you run from something that's everywhere? You can't drive in Jackson without seeing billboards that are immodest. You can't be on Facebook and get the fictitious friend request from the Russian woman who's dressed improperly, right? <laughs> you can't go to YouTube and look at, look at a clip and at the bottom, all this other stuff is just down there and it, had, it does not even relate to what you, the video you're looking at. You can't even search on Instagram for a, a friend that you can send them a message without going to the search feature and then you see all this other junk that you don't even want to see, it's forced upon us right now. How do you run from something that's everywhere? How do you deal with this when those desires and longings are there because something is really broken with God's people? How do you run? Like, how do you do it? And I'm telling you, it's hard. And just because it's hard, God's standard for purity and holiness it is not lowered. Therefore, we are all guilty of looking, of lusting, of not being content. 
of having things find us out. And that was not our intention to be there. It finds us right. Like in one sense, every one of us in this room, if you're honest, you've broken this commandment. You may be good now, you may be married, and your marriage may be healthy, but you weren't always in a healthy space. Therefore, we all need grace. Now, one of the, the graces to us in this passage, and it doesn't come to us as grace, but I'm insisting to you that it is gracious, is that, that Paul unpacks, well, why is this dangerous? Because he does show us the danger of sexual sin in this passage. He shows us first by showing its strength, then he shows us it, it, how dangerous it is because it's communal. Then he shows us how dangerous it is because it, it blinds some of who Jesus is. So how strong is sexual sin? If you notice this passage, their sinning was not a knowledge issue. That, that look at what Paul says, and, and you can follow with me. Look at what he says in, in verses uh, for one, for two and for six, he says, as you receive from us how you ought to walk right there. He they, they he, he he showed them and told them this is how to live. Look at verse two. You know what instructions we gave you in the Lord Jesus. So he says it again. Look down in verse six and all these things, as we told you beforehand, we solemnly warned you. That's past tense. In other words, he's saying when we were there planting the church, we told you about sexual morality over and over and over again. This is not new. I'm addressing this in this first letter. We planted the church. We preached this. We told you this. And now we're writing this letter addressing the same things. This means that sexual sin is not a knowledge issue. You can't know your way out of it. You can't have enough intellect. How many men and women know that sexual sin is wrong? And yet your knowing of God's word is brought to nothing. It's as if you know nothing. And that's the word here that he uses for in the passion of lust. It's the word pathology. In other words, what he is saying that when you don't know God, that you will behave pathologically. This is defective. It's wrong. And you know how you ought to live. That's what makes it dangerous. It's strong. It's enticing. It pulls you in and it keeps you there. The second thing he says is that it's, de it, it's deceptive in the sense that, and I think he's getting to this communal nature of sexual sin. So if you notice in the text, go back to chapter 3, look up to verse, uh, verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for, for one another and for all. So look at that. He says, may the Lord make you increase in love for one another inside the church. This is this is uh, Christian community language and for all. This is outside of the church. And so and, and so notice in this passage, two things that he he says, you are behaving like the Gentiles who don't know God. In other words, your sexual immorality, it is hurting the, 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 the city you're in. That you're behaving just like them and not set apart to him. And so when Christians boycott and get all in a stir about new legislation, about same sex stuff, you know what Jesus would say? He says, wait a minute. Like, do you know that you lead the nation in divorces? Do you know how many men who are unfaithful to their wives? You know how many wives are unfaithful to their husbands and you name the name of Christ and then you get rallied up when the outside world does something. They're doing the same thing we're doing. It's just a perversion in a different way. That's what Jesus says. If you have an issue with your brother, he says, take the log out of your own eye. Yes. Then go take the speck out of his. Notice what Jesus says. He does not say that we shouldn't be concerned about justice. He says, rather, the posture to go get engaged is after you do the work on your own heart, your own soul. Then you proceed out in holiness. Then you proceed out with humility. But if you get that wrong, we're just hypocrites. We look no different than the world. That's what Paul is saying in the text. Your behavior is just like the Gentiles. It's not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. It is never a private thing. It all it is always public. The other thing he says in this passage is that they were defrauding the brothers. So go down with me. Go down to um, let me find it. Right there in verse six of chapter four, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Right there. It's not just outside that he's concerned with. 
It's inside the church. In other words, what he's saying is as this church is interacting and doing life together, there is some defrauding going on because there's some sexual immorality in this church. Now, we don't know. We, Paul does not tell us what. Were there affairs inside the life of that church? Could be. Were the men in church tender and sweet with other members of the church, but then harsh with their own wives? So that the women in the church, they saw this nice and solid and, and sound guy that there was coveting going on. But this dude really wasn't he wasn't this way at home. He was just putting on the front in the show of people. Was there immodest dress in the life of the church where men were looking? Was there immodesty happening in the youth group where teenagers are, are starting and they didn't have texting? We, we don't know. We do not know. But what Paul says in this passage is that there was sexual morality in the church and they were defrauding one another. And he says it's damaging. And what this means is this. Your private fantasies always have public consequences. That when you privately look at pornography on your phone, it's always a public thing. You feel alone. That when you're lusting after someone, it feels like no one is looking, but you are defrauding your brother. That's his wife. That's her husband. And it hurts the body of Christ. But that's not all what he says. He also says that I think it hides some of Jesus. And you see it in this text. And I want to read. Well, I won't read it, but look at what he says in verse six. He says that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. So right there, he is an avenger. And that word for avenger, it really does mean a just judge who sees evidence and judges accordingly. Like all of that is kind of wrapped up in that phrase. And so that's what Paul is saying, that Jesus is an avenger. He sees and he acts. Now, here's the thing that, that I think J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, in chapter 14, he talks about Jesus as a judge. And he says this, and I'm going to paraphrase this, and I want to read the next quote. He basically says this, that if, you talk, if Christians talk about God as, gr as gracious, as compassionate, as being a father, we smile. But the moment you talk about God as being a judge, we frown. He says, there is one thing that's in the Bible that is crystal clear. God is a judge. He says, look at Adam and Eve. Look at Cain and Abel. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at Noah. Look at David. Look at Egypt. Look at what he did to the Israelites he brought out of Egypt who never made it into the land that they were supposed to be going. Then he goes into the New Testament. He says, look at the first Corinth. Look at look at the Corinthian church that they were taking communion in a defiled manner. And some of them were dying. These are like Christians. And so his point is this. He appeals to second Corinthians. He says, do we not remember that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we will be rewarded based on the things that we did in the body. He's talking to Christians. Now, this is where Packer is brilliant because he says that how do you reconcile being justified by faith and then this judgment that 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 this judgment language that you see in this text? This is what Packer writes. He says the free gift of salvation based on works of Christ is certainly shields believers from being eternally condemned to hell and banished from the eternal presence of God. But the gift of justification through Christ's work does not shield believers from being assessed as Christians and from forfeiting the good that other Christians will enjoy if it turns out that we have been slack, mischievous and destructive. Reward and law signify an enriched or improved impoverished relationship with God in heaven, though in ways that, that are beyond our present power to know. So what he's saying is that we will stand before Christ and Christians will be admitted to spend eternity with Jesus based on the work of Christ alone. However, we will stand before him and our deeds and the motivations of our hearts, they will be tested and weighed. And some of us will have nothing there because the fire of his judgment will consume it all. And there will be a degree of intimacy and closeness in heaven with Jesus that we will miss out on because we have been slack and mischievous in areas of our lives. Now, if that's the truth, 
Paul brings this up in the passage. Notice he does not say that Jesus will be an avenger. He uses a present tense form, which means that Jesus is is an avenger, which means that right now he stands and he is looking, which means that right now he sees even when we think our sexual sin is private, that it's in our minds, that he sees everything. And Paul says, don't you know he is an avenger? He is ready to act. And so this is why there is good news in this text. The good news is this. Sometimes the best thing to happen to you is to be caught. Sometimes the best thing to happen to us is to have our wives see what's going on. Sometimes the best thing to happen to us, and it is a grace, a grace, a grace of God to reach down and to rescue his people from things that will enslave us and ensnare us. He is being good, even though it's painful. He's being an avenger. He is stepping in and saying, no, you need to get caught, because if you don't get caught, you're going to be reckless. I love you too much to leave you in this. I'm going to wake your wife up and she's going to walk in the room and see what's going on. I'm going to let your husband go through Facebook and he's going to see these DMs that have been going on. I'm going to as a kid, you're going to give your phone to your parents and you better stop hiding it. And they need to have access to looking at your history. It's a good thing that they get caught, that we get caught, that we all get caught. It's gracious. It is Jesus Christ Almighty intervening, breaking into time and space, saying, I will not let you be consumed by this right now. I care about your future. It's not arbitrary. And some of you, some of us in this room, we're hiding. And I want to implore you. Jesus says, come out. You don't have to hide. It's dangerous for your soul. Now, where's the good news in this passage? Because there is deliverance that that Paul writes in this passage, and it comes to us in a few ways. I got to really make this fast. I think there's this sense that that in order to be delivered, that we really have to rightly know ourselves. Now, I know it looks like I'm bringing this out of left field. But there was a reason why last week, remember when I told you, I didn't think chapter 3, verses 11, 13, I I think the chapter mark needs to be up right after chapter 3, verse 10, and this is why. Please, please, please notice this order in this passage. Notice how what Paul says right here in chapter 3, verse 12, that he wants to make them increase and that the Lord to make them increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. Right there in verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. So right there, that it's a heart issue. And so notice down here when he's getting to the conduct, when he's getting to the running and the controlling this, that 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 this that this up here, the heart issue precedes the actions. In other words, if Jesus has the heart, he gets the actions. They they come with it. They flow out of it. That's why holiness is not just a matter of activity. It's a matter of what's going on in your heart. So for us who are wrestling and struggling, the issue isn't what we're doing. It's not what we're doing. That's part of the problem. The real problem is why are we doing it? What are we chasing after in lusting? What are we chasing after in these relationships that we should not be in? What are we chasing out after after these fantasies? I'll tell you what we're chasing after. We're chasing after God and we just don't know it. And that's what G.K. Chesterton says in in something he wrote. He says, every man or woman who knocks on the brothel door is really knocking for God. That it's never ultimately about sex. It's always about a void right here that's in your heart. A void that only God can make, that God can meet, that God can be, that God can feel. And so this is why... um, Diane Langberg, she has a beautiful quote. Here's what she says. She says, the soul is so constituted that it craves fulfillment from things outside of itself, and it will embrace earthly and physical joys for satisfaction when it cannot reach the spiritual ones. You see what's happening? All of our illicit sexual sin is not about the sin itself. It's about a void that we're looking for pleasure. 
We're looking for affirmation. We're looking for meaning. We're looking to be alive. And because we have that void right there, then we turn outward and try to find it in other things. And it never satisfies. That's why they call it addiction. And you keep coming back and coming back and coming back because it never, ever satisfies. How well do you know yourself, Christian? Not just what you do, but why you're doing it. Not information about yourself your height, your weight, your preferences. No, how well do you know you and what's driving this in you? That's the stuff that we got to deal with. But it's also about knowing your God. And that's what you see in this passage. He says you're behaving in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And this is not knowledge about God. This is knowing him. Knowing that he is beautiful, knowing that he is powerful, knowing that he is precious, that he is gracious, that he is loving, that he is compassionate, that there's a void there that he put there. He wrote eternity on your heart and only the eternal son of God can satisfy. And so it's an invitation to know him and not know about him. And there's a difference. See, we can know that he is gracious. We can know that he is forgiven. We can know that he is kind. But knowing about him is not the same as actually bringing him sins that he needs to forgive you of. It's not the same as coming to him needing power for your own life. It's not the same of just seeing his power and his beauty, but it's actually experiencing that in your own life. Like, Lord, if you don't step in and change me, I am gone. The last thing he shows us in this passage is you got to know the Holy Spirit. And that's the that's the, that's the game changer right here. Look at what he says in verse eight. Whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. In other words, that void that's right there, that deficit. The standard that God is calling you to. It's only reached when God's spirit is working and present. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, right? It's this dark, strong stuff that's way stronger than us. You need someone stronger than you to come by your side. And God has outdone himself. He's put himself inside of you to be strong and to mediate that relationship and to be strong when you're weak. He's put himself inside of you so that in the moment of temptation and it's all coming fast, like you're being neglected at home and, and this beautiful man or woman is in front of you. And it's happening in split seconds, right? It's happening very fast where there is something in you that wants to look and wants to covet and wants to lust. And then there's a Holy Spirit who says, tap your brakes. Father, make us attuned to your presence. Show up in these spaces and give me ways out. Capture my heart so that I don't run and act a fool. You can't do this in your own strength. And so the same Jesus who stands before you as an avenger to weigh the bad things that you're doing. He also stands before you as an avenger who says, look, there is real intimacy that you are forfeiting. There is real blessing that you are giving up. And so all these moments of temptation, they become avenues to worship. They become avenues to praise. They become avenues where we can slow down and honor our Savior by glorifying him with our bodies and our desires. And when we get to heaven, he says, I saw that. I, I, I did not miss that. I saw you and I will honor you. That's what God is calling us to through the gospel, through the giving of his spirit to help us in our weakness. We have the Holy Spirit. And he invites us to know our real selves and the real gospel and the real God to help us with real struggles. Let's pray. Father, we give this time to you and I pray that you will do a work upon all of our hearts. Lord, save us and sanctify us. We pray in Jesus name. Amen.